And what happens if something gets too close to the black hole horizon? How do you put it? Um, well, nothing terribly dramatic. <laughs> so, for example, an observer heading toward the horizon uh, gets a little bit stretched and squeezed by the black hole's gravitational field, the same way the moon squeezes and stretches the Earth, producing what we call tides. So there's that some squeezing going on. Um, but the clocks that the observer carries as he goes through the black hole tick in a completely normal way. Mm -hmm. He falls, falls through the black hole horizon in a finite time. Everything seems normal. But to an observer far away, uh, it seems to take longer and longer for that observer to reach the event horizon. The reports that the observer sends to the distant PAL come at greater and greater intervals. And finally, the last report sent just before uh, the poor person crosses the horizon takes a tremendous time to get to the distant observer. And so that's why in the early days, the Russian scientists who were studying black holes called them frozen stars. Because from an external point of view, it seemed that everything kind of froze at the horizon, right. okay. but never sort of completed the story. Right. Although we know that from the point of view of the person actually going in, he really does go in and hits the singularity. So the two viewpoints seem different. So, so if, um, if the Russians called them frozen stars, then why do we call them black holes? Sure. Uh, people often think of physicists as completely boring people, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we do know a thing or two about marketing. And the term black hole now has so caught the public right. imagination mm -hmm. so much that it's really uh, been a help. Well, marketing is one thing, but it, they just seem so strange. It's just hard to believe that they're really out there. Well, it's true. They are very strange, and Einstein and many of his contemporaries simply thought, found they, thought they were too strange to, mm -hmm. to be believed. And indeed, for between the 1930s and the 1950s, Physicists didn't think much about them because they had other priorities, trying to understand nuclear physics, particle physics, developing things like mm. lasers and, and, and semiconductors and such. So it wasn't really until uh, the late 1950s that people started to take them seriously. First because people could show that these, the event horizon wasn't a singular place, that it was completely well behaved. Um, second because people studying supernovae explosions explosions of stars realized that the central core of the star could collapse down and form a black hole. And finally because uh, new x-ray uh, telescopes put into space were detecting systems where people really thought the black holes might exist. We have traveled about five kilometers and 90 years in time from the old observatory of Schwarzschild to the modern research institute where over 100 scientists work on Einstein's theory full-time. So Cliff, why did X-ray astronomers think they were seeing black holes? Well, what they saw was uh, a system consisting of a star and a small object orbiting the star. And that object was drawing gas from the surface of the star. The gas went around the object, heated up by friction to very high temperatures, and then emitted X-rays that could be detected by these satellites. So when they put all this data together, they realized that this object had to be very small and very massive, maybe 10 times the mass of the sun. Okay. The only object that could be is a black hole. Right, but not all black holes are discovered using X-ray. No, a whole other class of black holes are discovered by looking at uh, radio and optical light coming from huge jets that are being mm -hmm. emitted from objects uh, deep in the centers of uh, massive galaxies. Okay. In fact, uh, one, uh, in recent years, uh, Reinhard Gensel has been able to measure the orbits of stars orbiting uh, a central object in our own Milky Way galaxy. Mm. And by looking at those orbits, they concluded that that object must be a black hole of about three and a half million times the mass of the sun. Oh, wow. Um, right, so, but how do black holes form? Where do they, do they come from the Big Bang? Or? No, we don't think they came from the Big Bang, but instead came later than the Big Bang by processes that involve maybe the collapse of a core of a star during a supernova explosion, mm -hmm. and also possibly by growing black holes to very large masses inside these uh, galaxies. How big on average is a black hole? How big it is depends on its mass. So okay. a black hole of the mass of the Earth will be about as big as my thumbnail. Okay. Well. A black hole as big as with the mass of the sun will be about as big as a small city. Mm. Um, a black hole with a billion times the mass of the sun will be about as big as our own solar system okay. in size. Okay. So these are very compact objects that contain a lot of mass. 
But do they start small? Do, do all black holes start small and then get bigger the more they feed? Or? Uh, it really depends. Uh, okay. The X-ray type black holes probably don't grow very much. They're formed in this collapse and then they right. orbit around and accrete small amounts of gas to emit X-rays. Okay. But the massive black holes in galaxies probably grew from smaller seeds, maybe 10,000 times the mass of the sun, up to millions and billions of times the mass of the sun. But in fact, we're not exactly sure how that process works. It's one of the big questions that people are asking these days. Right. Um, do scientists ever think that black holes will disappear? Um, not the astrophysical black holes that we are talking about. Okay. Now, there is this Sorry. process that uh, Stephen Hawking uh, has discussed over the years called, we today call Hawking of apparition, that combines gravity and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that tells us that black holes could evaporate away by emitting radiation and particles. But this process is only is important for mini type black holes, like ones that might be at the Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. But for astrophysical black holes, this process is so, so weak that it has no bearing on what, they, what these black holes will do. Okay. Um, I've heard that um, black holes, you can't see that they're really there, but you just see everything around it. Is that, is that true? Um, so far. Okay. But what we really hope is that uh, one day, maybe within the next 10 years, we will start seeing gravitational radiation from black holes. For example, when two black holes orbit each other faster and faster and merge to form one black hole, that process will emit gravitational radiation that is coming directly from the warped space-time of those black holes. So this will be a new way to look at these objects. But we haven't yet seen the black holes emitting gravitational waves or radiation? No, and that is one of the goals of a current generation of uh, gravitational wave detectors that are up and running in the world uh, to try to see this. Okay. So what, what's left to learn about black holes? What, is it just the beginning or is it almost understood? Um, well, if it were understood, everything were understood, it would be boring and we'd go off and do <laughs> something else. Um, but there are lots of big questions. Where do they, how do they form? Where do these massive black holes come from? And also, is Einstein's description of black holes really correct? Mm. We think we believe Einstein's theory is correct, mm. but uh, it makes definite predictions about the warped space time around black holes, and we'd like to check yeah. whether that's really right. How did you get into black holes? Well, when I started out 40 years ago as a graduate student, mm. um, it was, this was really the early days, and right, people so, weren't yeah. taking black holes yeah. all that seriously. Mm. So I began by looking at the question of whether Einstein's theory itself is correct. So I did a lot of work analyzing experiments that people were doing. I even suggested a few experiments that were done later on to just verify the basic theory. Because if you don't believe the theory, then it's hard to believe right. in its yeah. predictions like black holes. Later, when I started becoming interested in gravitational radiation, I really got into black holes because one of the leading sources of gravitational waves is this merger process of two black holes. So okay. that's when uh, uh, I really got, got into yeah. it. So we still haven't seen gravitational waves, so they're still a theoretical concept, right? I mean, how can we be sure that they're out there? Um, well, it's really because there's now a, a, an accumulating body of evidence from many different directions mm -hmm. that, that makes us feel that black holes are, are real. So in the early days when these X-ray sources were first discovered, people tried alternative explanations. And when we talked about quasars, uh, people tried alternate ways to explain these phenomena that didn't use black holes. But strangely, as the observations got better and better, the black hole explanation gave a much better picture of what was going on. So it's a, it, this is a really how science works. You accumulate information from many different directions, and when it all holds together, then you really start to believe that these things uh, are really out there, and then you go to the next step of trying to detect them with gravitational waves and other means. Great. Well, it's been really great talking to you today, Cliff. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.